Thank you to our Dare to Declare Choir. That was a great job. Will you turn in your Bibles to John chapter 5? <clears throat> so in the, in the news this week, there is the story of Sam Baker. He was eight years old, and uh, just a little over a week ago, uh, Sam, with a team of three other guys, including his father, ascended El Capitan. Uh, El Capitan is one of the hardest uh, rock climbs in the world. It's about 3,000 feet of vertical climbing. In fact, it was, it's so difficult that this group that climbed it uh, started early on a Thursday and quit at about 1 a.m. and camped on the rock face, uh, strapped in and hanging in there. There's sleeping and eating and doing the things that you do together. And then the next morning when they got up, they finished the climb. And uh, it's believed to be the youngest person, Sam, who's ever ascended El Capitan. Um, if you watch what happens, what they did was uh, someone in their team would take the lead, would ascend some of the of the rock face, establishing where the ropes should go, fixing in the ropes, and then those ropes were the security for uh, the rest of the team, including the eight-year-old, to climb up, and that was just sort of the path. It's pretty remarkable. And I suspect that many of us sort of look at that, and that becomes a little bit of a metaphor for the spiritual life. Uh, Jesus has ascended in front of us, and we're supposed to follow him up along the similar path. And, and there's probably a hint of a way to, to use that constructively. Uh, but I don't think it's enough. I think we would do better to have something that's a little deeper than looking at Jesus as the one who ascended in front of us. And now we, we kind of follow that path. I want you to see Jesus doesn't just blaze the trail. He actually is the path himself. We go through him. So we're going to read this section in John 5 uh, in just a second. I'm going to start in verse 1. Before we do, let's pray that God would bless our reading and meditation on his word. Our Father in heaven, we come to you because it, it, this word is yours. It belongs to you. It reveals you. And, and unless you bless us, unless your spirit guides us, unless you do an internal work that starts inside us and in our hearts, we'll never be able to receive what your word says. We're simply by nature not spiritual. We trust ourselves. We trust the way we see things. And you must help us have the, the, the sight that comes by faith to look upon Jesus and to see him as Savior for us. Father, today, we come from a lot of different backgrounds with a lot of different um, perspectives. Some of us come bearing grief or disappointment or anxiety or fear, trauma and hurt, physical uh, ailment and disability. Father, we also sometimes come with a lot of self-confidence, a sense that we can manage this life on our own and we pray that your word would address each of your children here today. That you would penetrate the defenses that we put up. That you would comfort us in our anxieties and fears and hurts. That you would lead us to righteousness and to life, even abundant life. And most of all, that you would help us behold Jesus as he is revealed in the scriptures, as he really is, that we might trust in him. Father, would you give us your blessing as we read your word and accomplish your purposes among your people. We pray for this in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand for the reading of God's word? John chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. I think it's page 890 if you're using one of the pew Bibles. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, a pool, 
in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up while I'm going. Another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who has been healed, it is the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now, the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn and there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away, and he told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. This is God's word. It's completely true and utterly trustworthy. You may be seated. So when my children were little, I had this little game that I've played with them, and probably some of you have done so, the game of kind of trust fall. You know what I'm talking about? My children would be uh, sitting on the truck bed on the edge, you know, and I would be behind them and I would say, I'll catch you, just fall back. I put my hands out. Now, this was when they were little and I was confident I could catch them and they believed that I would. I think they thought that I could and, I ended, and that I would. They didn't have any reason to doubt whether I would catch them. And I think it's kind of fun sometimes just to have that experience of fall and put yourself in the hands of someone else, but it is not easy. It was not easy for them to do it. They would start to lean back just a little, and they go, no, not doing it. <laughs> From a very, very early age, we learn to trust our balance. We learn to trust our decision-making, we learn to trust that the person who's going to take the best care of me and make sure I'm safe is me. And while I know my dad would probably catch me and I know that he's got my best interest in mind, I still think I make the best decisions for me. And we start with that dynamic very early. Here comes Jesus into your life. And here's what he says, fall into me, trust me. You're going to have to let go of some of these things where you find your own confidence. You're going to have to put away your sense of self-confidence. You're going to have to trust me. And letting go of control, well, that's not that easy. In fact, uh, the most significant portion of all of your anxieties is the lack of control. When I can control something, I'm not that anxious. Now, at some level, that's a little foolish because uh, I've made a mess of things plenty of times. Anxious, anxiety, that inner turmoil, the, the thing that keeps you awake at night. It's this stuff that's just on the horizon. You go, but I can't control it. Control, managing, it is sort of deeply embedded into the way we manage and function and operate in life. I want to be able to control things. 
And then it bleeds over into our spiritual lives in a really profound way. I want you to kind of see it in in this passage. I want to look at how we keep control, how we manage the law, and then how we make a God. Keep control, manage the law, and make a God. Here's the first one. Let's keep control. I want to be the guy who pulls the strings and operates stuff for my life. In this passage, we see this man who is paralyzed. And obviously, if you're paralyzed, then you don't have a lot of resources to control things. You depend on other people. And there was a pool, Bethesda. And once in a while, the waters would stir it up, and the going thought was that it was an angel that was stirring the water. And if you would, with your ailment of whatever, get into the stirred up water first, you would gain some kind of spiritual miracle that would heal you, that the angel's life-giving power would go into your body and you'd be well. And if you're a paralyzed man, you don't just show up there, you know, like you're commuting to work. You have to have someone bring you. You have to have someone put the mat down and put your body down right on the edge of the pool and hope that that day was the day the water would get stirred and you could throw yourself into it. What was really going on? Well, that pool had uh, a spring that fed it. And the spring would occasionally release either water or, I mean, warm water or air that would come up and cause the water to bubble and to stir. And who are the people that when they see it get, you know, get in first? What's the people with the least significant ailments? A blind person doesn't see it. They have to hear it and try to get in. A lame person can't push themselves in. It's the guy who's there with, you know, some lower back pain. It's the woman who's there who has uh, a headache or a stomach virus. And of course... They get in, and if it's something that's muscular, even that warm, bubbly water is probably nice. It's relaxing and refreshing. It has a sense of healing. And then they go and get better, and they tell everyone, I got better getting in the pool. I must have been first. And so the really hopeless look there and hope, maybe one day I'll be the first one in. And for 38 years, he lay there unable to get himself in. But do you kind of see what's happening? It's the achiever. It's the one who can get themselves in the water. That's the one who gets the blessing. And all you got to do is get in. I just need to do this one thing, and then I will win from heaven this good gift. It's a, a way that we want to manage the spiritual the presence of God into our lives. If I will do the right things, then I will receive from heaven the blessings I want. We're not going to be quite so um, all right, naive, maybe, to believe in the superstition. You go and you see water stirring, you don't go, I bet that's an angel. You look at it and you think, I bet that's some kind of air. Just like, you know, we do as we read this passage. But how about this? You ever had the morning where you woke up a little early? And you're like, well, I'm up. I think I'll read my Bible and I'll pray. And so you read your Bible and you pray and you're like, I don't know why I don't do this every morning. This has been good for my soul. And you're like going through the day and you're like, I've been with God. Today is going to be a great day. And you get to the first thing at school or work and And a a relationship just is really a mess. Somebody mistreats you or uh, a meeting goes very badly. You get criticized. You're like, okay, this isn't how I expected the day to go. And, And the little pieces of things that you're like, where is God's blessing? I read my Bible this morning. I thought God would make this day go better. What you catch, and that is the very same idea. If I could just get myself in the water, then I would get the blessing. If I would just do the right things, that's how I know that I'll get God's blessing. I want to manage God. 
I want to win the right and earn the, him coming into my life. I want to open the door and say, here's where you're welcome, and then go, okay, but there's some other parts I don't want you to mess with. I want to be the one who says, this is how you get to come into my life. But did, did you see this passage? How did Jesus come into this man's life? Is this man an invalid? Is he paralyzed and going, Jesus, son of David, come and heal me? A blind man does that later. A leper comes to Jesus and says, if you're willing, you could make me clean. We, we saw, uh, I guess it was last week, there was a, 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 a governor, a leader, a ruler who said, Jesus, heal my son. There were plenty of people who'd heard of him or asking him. This guy had no interest in Jesus. He had no knowledge of him. In fact, when Jesus does heal him, he shows up and some people said, who did this? And he goes, I don't know. If you had been paralyzed for 38 years and somebody said, hey, I want you to stand up and walk and you could, don't you think you would get his or her name? Wouldn't you ask, what can I do to repay you? How can I respond? It's who are you that you could do this? This guy, for whatever reason, and, you know, maybe I'm being too hard on him. For 38 years, he's not been able to carry a mat, to lift, stand up and walk, to do things on his own. Maybe he just wanted to get back into his life. Maybe he had somebody. He says, I want to go show them what has happened to me, that he just forgot about Jesus. But please notice Jesus didn't come to him because this guy was expecting him or praying for him or seeking Jesus in any way. Jesus came to him and he said, well, that's a pretty remarkable question, isn't it? Oh, you're a paralyzed man. You're lying beside this pool where people want to get healed. Do you want to get healed? <laughs> I think the answer is obvious. Jesus here is kind of coming in and saying something to him. He's starting the conversation. Jesus took the initiative. And the answer to that question isn't quite as obvious as you might think. If I heal you, you're going to lose some control. There are going to be things that come into your life that you didn't expect. And of course, if Jesus comes into your life, if he begins to metal with this inner person, he's going to try to reorient every part of you to being about God and to loving your neighbor and to being able to deny yourself. Do you want to be healed if God's going to do that? If you're going to have to let go of what you've managed and controlled and put yourself in his hands? How about this? Have you ever said, Lord, if you will just make this, this meeting go well, then I'll invite my neighbor to church. Or I will give up television for a week. I don't know, whatever you would want to bargain with. God, if you'll just do this for me, then I'll start doing this for you. You know what is going on there, right? God, I think there's this stuff you'd like for me to do and I haven't been doing it. So this is an opportunity. I will bargain with you this thing you want if you'll give me what I want. I know what's good for me and it's this thing going well, but I don't trust you to give it to me. It's better to say this, Jesus, you're in control of this meeting and its outcome. And if it goes well, thank you. And if it goes poorly, go with me. And I recognize on a separate issue that you've been leading me to invite my neighbor to come to church. Help me to do that tomorrow. You hear the difference in those? There's no bargaining. There is simply trust. And Jesus is saying, you let go and trust me. Well, what happens when we trust him? And we start to say, I want to obey. We start to look at his commands. And I go, okay, God, show me your commands. And then I look at his commands and I go, okay, that's pretty invasive. 
Let's pick one command. Keep the Sabbath. Six days you shall work and one day you're to rest. This command, and we go, okay, I like it. Rest is good. I'm in favor of rest and work. I think I should work. These all make kind of sense to me. But let's just negotiate this a little bit, Lord. What kind of things qualify as rest? And, and God, what are some things I really have to not do for me to keep the Sabbath? Could you give me a list? And perhaps frustratingly, he doesn't give us a list. He doesn't say, here are some things you can do and here are some things you can't do. He doesn't give us this, you know, series of boxes where I can go, okay, this Sabbath day I checked off the boxes and I've done what I'm supposed to do. Again, he asks us to, to trust him, to walk with him, to work these things out with him. But that isn't how we want to do it. So what we do is we actually create sub-laws like don't carry anything. On the Sabbath, when I was in Israel uh, for a, a, one of those tours, it was on the Saturday, which is the Jewish Sabbath, and we were in the hotel, and, I'm, and we've come down for breakfast, and I go over to the, to the elevator, and I start pushing the button, and the light won't come on, and I push it, you know, because what, what are you going to do? <laughs> the light won't come on, and then one of the doors opens. Oh, all right. So I get in, and I push my floor. I think I was like floor seven. I can't remember. But I pushed seven, and the light doesn't come on. And I, same routine. Keep pressing, and the door closes, and it goes up to two. <laughs> and then four, and then six, and then eight. And I'm like, I better get off here. And I went down the stairs. What I had discovered is that on the Sabbath day, one elevator goes one, three, five, seven. The other one goes two, four, six, and eight plus one because it would be unnecessary work to push the buttons. Now, I, being a, an uninformed Gentile, pushed the buttons a lot more <laughs> and had to walk down a flight of stairs to do less work. You see what's happening is here is, is we want to make the law manageable. I want to create a way that I can look at it and I can check the boxes and go, I'm doing fine. And as soon as I can check all the boxes and say, I did what I'm supposed to do, then I can basically say, God, I didn't even need you today. Look what I did. You see, I create these little rules. Now, you, you're going to have to think about what does it mean to rest? on the Sabbath to obey the command. You're going to have to think about what does it mean to work before the Lord for six days to obey the command. You must think about it. And there has to be real things. But here, they had created a law that was meant to be manageable. But look what Jesus does. Just, just behold this. He comes to the man and he says, get up. Pick up your bed and walk. Now, for 38 years, at least, this man had come to lie down because someone carried him and carried his mat for him. Don't you think that every single time there is this fantasy in his head that he would one day get in the water, get well, and he would walk carrying his own mat home. And Jesus said, I give to you what will really restore you. Get up. Pick up your mat and walk. He didn't violate the Sabbath. This wasn't one of the Sabbath commands. It was breaking the man-made expression of it. We have all these ways that we measure spirituality, how... How many things did you do at church this week? That's one way we'll measure spirituality. How busy are you? How, you know, many times did you pray? We will put these things and we'll kind of get a way to measure how spiritual I've been this week because I have a nice man-made criteria. What Jesus says is, look, 
If you want to please God, you must have faith. You have to trust him. There really isn't another substitute. And, and I will tell you, you get this real clear picture of what it's like to manage the law. If you're doing it, here's where you'll see it happening. This guy shows up. He's been a, a paralyzed man for 38 years and he's walking. And the Pharisees see him and they go, who told you to carry your mat? They don't ask, who healed you? They don't go, you've been paralyzed for 38 years. Praise the Lord what has happened. You have received such mercy. They're looking at, did you do the right stuff? Can you praise the Lord that he's at work? Can you be thankful that he's healing people? Can you rejoice at it when it's somebody who, go, who doesn't really kind of check all the boxes and, and mark out how it works? Can, can somebody who's somewhat new to the faith get involved in your life and it really causes some havoc in your life, but you're like, well, praise the Lord. This guy, this gal is coming to faith and getting well. Can you trust the Lord with those parts that just aren't working yet? The last thing we do is we, we make a God. And here's what I mean by that. We, in, instead of saying, I want to trust the God who's there, the God who's real, the God revealed in Jesus, the God we read about in the Bible, I want God to be like I want him to be. So this man sees Jesus again. Verse 14, afterward Jesus found him. Please note he wasn't going out looking for Jesus yet. This man was healed. He'd been paralyzed. He didn't get Jesus' name, and he's still not looking for him. Afterward, Jesus found him. And in the temple said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. You know, we kind of want a God who will give us the healing and then let us go on our own. And Jesus comes along and he says, I've made you well. Now go and sin no more. I'd like a God who would say, you sinned, oh well, no big deal. I like to forgive. And God is gracious and he loves showing mercy. It's true, but I want you to hear his blessing to you. Go and sin no more. Turn away from that sin. You do not come to a God who is happy that you might get, go on sinning though you have received his grace and though he forgives, he calls you out of that sin. Look what Jesus says. Verse 17, Jesus answered them, my father is working until now and I am working. He wants you to hear that he didn't stop working, you know, in the New Testament. He kept going. He continues to work. He doesn't take a day off. The one who keeps you never slumbers and he never sleeps. Jesus is working all the time. And what's the work he is doing but to save you from your sins, not to save you to keep on sinning. He calls you to repentance and to give up your sins. He calls you to this new life where you say, Jesus, I want to be well, not just be able to carry my bed. But to do that, I need to be able to lay down this sin and I can't do that unless you help me. And he says, well, I'm always at work doing that. He is right now doing this work in you to restore you to a joyful fellowship with God. It's what you were made for. He is right now at work putting your sin to death and raising you to this new powerful life of obedience and righteousness in joyful trust. Not in just checking the boxes. He wants you to learn how to be a creature in God's world. Not a God of our own design. But to be able to say in full and radical trust, Jesus you lead, you empower I'll follow, you're the way, and there is no other. 
So I'll trust you to take control. And I will trust you to, to lead me in obedience. And I will trust you to work until there's a, a power to do that life that you want. Instead of who I think I should be, I trust you. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, um, I pray that you would help us trust you. You would help us give ourselves more fully to you to let go of that which we claim for ourselves and to embrace this work you're doing to redeem, to restore, to rescue, to forgive, and to lead us into new life. Father, encourage us to believe, to fall into the hands of Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.